So now we're moving on to weed management, and uh, this is going to be um, uh, uh, Dr. Rich Bonanno from uh, UMass is going to be leading our conversation around weed management challenges. Put that up or did they put that on? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay, Arnold, can you hear Yes, me? we can hear you. Okay, so we'll get right into it. We won't waste any time since we're already behind. Uh, if I can figure out how to change the slide, I'll be, there we go. So I want to start with some, some uh, sort of chronologically, start talking about perennial weed control, which is something that we're going to be doing in the fall. I know some people have said, well, if I'm going to be using Roundup in the spring to kill the cover crop, isn't that also a good time to go after a perennial weed? And that's not the right time to go after a perennial weed. The perennial weed needs to be controlled in the fall because if you're after a perennial, you're looking to control what's below ground, almost more important than what's controlling what's above ground. And the time that you're going to get the translocation of the Roundup is going to be in the fall, and it's not going to be in the spring. So in terms of fall timings, um, the um, late summer or, or fall is the best time to control the perennial weeds with Roundup or 2,4-D. The thing is, is that if it's a grass, you can go later. If it's a broadleaf, you need to go earlier before it gets too cold. But we're not just talking about perennials now. We're talking about the potential of also having a cover crop there. So we're going to think of both of them being there at the same time. So if you're using Roundup, you need to make the applications as late as possible, but before establishing the cover crop. You do have the option of putting the Roundup on after the cover crop is seeded, but before the cover crop comes up. That can buy you a few more days into the fall, because really later is better in most cases once you get past uh, sort of midsummer. But again, with the broadleafs, you don't want to wait too long, because if you get cold weather, you're going to hurt those broadleafs. You're not going to get the kill of the perennials. So, um, but if you're using 2,4-D, if you're after a broadleaf perennial and you're establishing a grass cover crop, you do have the option of waiting a little bit, especially if you want to establish the cover crop a little bit earlier, because as long as the cover crop has some growth on it, the 2,4-D will have minimal effect on the cover crop and will still control the broadleaf weed. So if you're after... Uh, uh, something that's a vining weed uh, or um, a dandelion or something like that, uh, 2,4-D can work just as well in the fall on these broadleaves. It's just that um, you've got to get the grass a little bit established first before you go ahead and do it. Okay. Um, so now we get to the spring, and we're killing cover crops now, and, and, I, and I guess I'm going to take advantage of having some people in the room and just asking a couple of, a couple of questions. What rate of Roundup are you using per acre? A quart. And how many gallons of water? Forty. Okay. All right. So in general, when you're killing cover crops, there's no question that Roundup is the most reliable uh, material that you can use. Uh, keeping the one thing about Roundup, though, is that the more concentrated you can make the droplets, the better it's going to work. And I know there's been some discussion back and forth about whether or not you can do it in one application or whether you need more than one application. There's, there's some things I maybe want to discuss that uh, might relate to how that all comes together. The first is that Roundup will always work better if you can put it in less water per acre. Okay, So 10 to 20 gallons of water per acre is better than 30 to 40 gallons of water per acre. And if, if the cover crop is small and only a few inches high, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. But when you're dealing with something that's a little bit more vigorous and, and requires a little bit more effort, uh, using less water is better. It's almost counterintuitive because you think you're not going to get enough coverage, but it really comes down to the concentration of the droplets. And so in most cases, you'll find that lowering the amount of water is better. Now, there's two ways to lower the amount of water. One is, and, and let me just say that, that reducing the rate of water is a linear decrease based on the type of nozzle you're using. So if you're using, for example, an 04 nozzle tip, and you're putting out, say, 40 gallons of water per acre. So if you're using an 04 and you're putting out 40 gallons, if you switch to an 02, you'll put out 20 gallons. If you switch to an 01, you'll put out 10. If you have an 03, you'll put out 30. So it's, it's a linear kind of thing. So to me, the simplest way to change the gallonage is to change the nozzle tip. That works a whole lot better than driving twice as fast or four times as fast because then you're not going to do a good job. You're going to be bouncing. The boom's going to be flying. So, uh, and you, because Roundup is a liquid, it's, it's a salt, and it dissolves basically in water, 
you don't have to worry about using a small nozzle tip and having blockage like you might be with a powder or something that, that could get stuck there. Uh, so really, low, using a smaller nozzle tip is really the better way to do it. Um, conversely, oh, and one other thing is, is uh, just be careful about your boom height. You don't want to have your boom so low that you're skipping areas uh, or so high that you're maybe getting excess drift. So make sure you're getting different, decent coverage at least on uh, so the height of the canopy that's giving you the most uh, foliage there. Uh, so you're getting good coverage. Uh, some people have asked about gramoxone, and gramoxone is a contact material, but most of these cover crops are annuals, and so uh, getting penetration down to the root system is not necessarily something that we need the herbicide to do. Uh, the root system will die as a result of the top dying. Uh, so, but the difference is the gramoxone is a contact material. It's not a translocated material. So contacting every leaf is much more critical. And so ideally, if you can get the, round, the, the water levels up to 80 or 100 gallons of water per acre, uh, you're going to do a lot better. So if you're normally using 40 and you were going to try Gramoxone, you could just drive half the speed, you know, as long as you don't have to cover 100 acres or something like that, uh, as a way to, um, uh, to change the gallonage. Don't change pressure as a way to change gallonage because that relationship is not linear. You would need a 4x change in pressure to give you a 2x change in volume. And you don't want to change the pressure by 4x because you're going to have fines flying all over the place. It's just not a good way to do it. So changing nozzle tips is much easier. Or if you want to increase gallonage, slowing the tractor down is, is a way to do it. And as many people have said already, uh, wait until the cover crop is dead capital D-E-A-D, before working the soil. And sometimes, and, you know, uh, my family will say dead or dead, dead. And, and we're talking dead, dead. So make sure it's, they're really dead and the roots are starting to decompose uh, before you try to work the soil. Okay, uh, some questions that people have asked. This is what my slides are really based on to try to cover some of these things. Uh, so residue levels on herbicide effectiveness. Uh, and the first is that all soil-applied herbicides need to reach the the so re need to reach the soil and penetrate the soil to work. Most of these herbicides are working by either getting into the root system as the radical emerges from the weed seed or they're designed to control the shoot of the weed just as it's emerging from the soil. So you have to have the herbicide into the soil. And if rain is not imminent, then you have to irrigate, just like you would in any bare ground herbicide application. Uh, now, the thing that makes this a, a little bit um, uh, more difficult is is it, is, it, is it difficult to get all this to happen if you've got a heavy cover crop there? And certainly dead covers are easier to work with. I think that there's less potential for uptake of the herbicide into a cover um, if the cover is dead. If you've got green foliage, there seems to be always the possibility that some of that herbicide could be taken up by the foliage of the weed depending on the herbicide. So I think dead covers are easier to work with. And as long as you've got enough moisture to drive it through, um, then the amount of residue does not affect the weed control. Because if it's dead, it's not going to be absorbing any herbicide. It's just a question of getting it through that cover. And, and to me, that would be one of the biggest questions uh, that I would have in general is just to make sure that you get good activation. Because unless you can get that herbicide in the soil surface, it's just not going not to work or, or actually into the top inch or so of soil. Okay. Uh, cultivation, a lot of people have talked about cultivation, and I guess it really comes down to what crop you're growing, what kind of weed control you're getting, um, and, and if you're really trying to create a, a no-till environment or a reduced tillage environment, uh, is, is we on a hillside, is erosion important? Uh, on the other hand, if you're not getting good weed control, you need to really get in there and, and to be able to, um, uh, to knock some of those weeds back in those row middles. You, know, you may be doing some cultivation right in the row as well. Uh, but to me, as long as the cultivator can be pulled through the, the field and not clogged, then the cultivation is possible. I, I, I don't think, though, it's, it's that easy to do shallow cultivation. One of the things that always worries me about cultivation is going too deep and damaging the roots of the crop. Uh, uh, get rid of, uh, losing excess soil moisture or losing too much soil moisture and also bringing more weed seeds close to the soil surface so you're in effect killing weed seeds but sort of repopulating the top of the, of the soil surface by bringing more weed seeds uh, back to the top. Um, so, and just remember that any surface effects of residue 
cover are going to be negated. So if you, have, if you want that cover there because of soil erosion, reduce soil splashing for diseases and those kinds of things, I mean, you're going to lose that when you go in and cultivate. But I realize that weed control can be a problem here. And, and for a lot of these crops, uh, you know, sweet corn I'll discuss a little bit later. Sweet corn is really one of the best crops to grow because you can get excellent weed control. But some of these other crops, you just don't have the best weed control options to be able to kill everything without throwing some cultivation potentially into the mix. Um, and this goes back to the amount of cover. I mean, we saw that one shot there where the cover was really, really thick. And the person that commented on it still talked about having problems with weeds. It can look really good to start off with, but it doesn't mean the weeds will eventually come, and it just depends on the crop. If you're growing pumpkins, you can get really good cover over the top before the weeds come, then maybe you don't need cultivation. But on the other hand, the soil is warm, you don't have a lot of cover, the weeds are going to come early. Uh, so, uh, you know, cultivation is something that may be part of the mix. And I already, already mentioned about shallow cultivation, it's always best, but not, may not be the easiest. Uh, when the cover residue is present. Uh, with the right equipment, I think it's a little easier to cover in the, cultivate in the strip where the crop is growing. Um, if you've got the right baskets, if you don't have stony ground, maybe use a, a basket cultivator. Uh, I've even seen people use uh, the, the small double front uh, gangs, like from a Littleston rolling cultivator, they get right in that bed, right in the strip. It stays in there, and then it minimizes any, any uh, movement of soil outside that strip. So I think there's, there's possibilities. Uh, I just think when you're throwing the sort of the reduced tillage aspect of it in the cover, it just makes cultivation more difficult, and that's more of an equipment issue uh, than anything else. Uh, soil types and, and, and rates, uh, basically, uh, and my second bullet point has a problem with it that I, I realized this morning, so let me, I'll hit that later. But first bullet point, so soil types and rates, follow the label directions for the amount of herbicide to use just like you would normally do based on soil organic matter and soil type. So the amount of, of residue on the top has nothing to do with selecting the rate. You can't say, oh, geez, I've got all this cover there, so I must need the higher rate that goes along with the higher organic matter content because that's not the type of organic matter you're worried about with herbicides. When you're talking about organic matter and herbicides, you're talking about humic acid. You're not talking about raw organic matter sitting on the surface. So just uh, as you would with any rate, you look at that rate, you look at the percent organic matter of your soil, you look at your soil type, and that's how you select the rate. So in general, less sand and more clay requires a higher rate for most herbicides, also a greater amount of soil organic matter, not residue cover, usually requires higher rates. So, so rates are the same regardless of whether cover is there or not. Uh, soil type does not generally affect the, the choice of herbicide, I put rate here, but that's wrong. Well, the question really had to do with the selection of the herbicide. So soil type generally does not affect the, the selection of an herbicide unless you're talking about either soils that are very, very high in organic matter like muck soils where certain herbicides don't work and the label will say they don't work, or you're dealing with soils that are very, very sandy and there might be issues with, uh, with uh, uh, either leaching or something with soils. Uh, certain labels may preclude an application on certain soil types because the organic matter is very, very low. Uh, but generally, none of this should affect the rate that, that you apply of any of these materials. Okay, so uh, I wanted to just to go through three different crops were mentioned to me. And I, and, uh, oops. I went the wrong way. Now my pointer's doing all kinds of things. Okay. Um, can you get me back on track there? Yep. And pop me down to uh, the first crop. Crucifers. Okay. It was interesting to me that somebody asked a question about crucifers because um, even though this is new for a lot of people, when I used to work at North Carolina State University uh, back in the 80s, we actually had a, a research project with the Tennessee Valley Authority. And our issue back then was up in the mountains of North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, basically up in Appalachia, uh, there were huge erosion problems and a lot of cabbage growers, guys growing cabbage and broccoli on very, very hilly soils. And we were looking at this whole system back then for erosion control. And we were using something called the bush hog uh, a row till, which was basically a strip tillage piece of equipment. It had two fluted cultures in the front. It had the subsoiling shank, and it had the baskets in the back. And what we were doing is we were going into covers exactly the same as this, killing the cover crop in the spring. But the crop in question was cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, and pretty much a transplanted uh, crop in these soils. 
And so uh, but what we found, and this just sort of highlights the, the sort of the importance of herbicides here, generally in this country, the move to reduce tillage and no tillage sort of became more practical and possible with more herbicides being registered because of the whole cultivation thing and, and the ability um, uh, to, you know, losing the ability to cultivate in a lot of cases. So it was actually when we got gold registered as a pre-transplant herbicide did the whole system fall into place because we just didn't have a good broadleaf material. So basically with crucifers, we're talking about transplants, gold pre-transplant followed by either Devernal or Dactyl over the top after transplanting. Uh, use of Treflan is difficult because it has to be incorporated. It only works in the strips. It's not going to use bet be work between the strips without incorporation. So we never really were able to use Treflan in, this, in the system. Uh, in some cases, and, and depending on the state and so forth, command could be used. Command's only registered in cabbage, though. It would be used not to replace the goal, but instead of either Devernal or Dactyl. And also, in some states, there's a registration for dual or dual magnum uh, for controlling broadleaf or uh, some broadleaf weeds and grasses and crucifers. So again, uh, goal would be the basic material pre-transplant, followed by any one of these grass herbicides that also has some broadleaf activity. So either Devernal or Dactyl, or depending on the situation, command or dual. Uh, of course, in any of these crops, if grasses come through, uh, crabgrass, panicums, foxtails, and so forth, uh, any of the post-emergence grass materials can be used depending on what's registered. So post, fusillade, select, assure, depending on what the, the, the label is. Um, weed management, I think, with direct seeding is difficult because you lose the opportunity to have the goal. Uh, unless you're using the transplants. And so I think as you're going to other crucifers, other, you know, cruciferous greens where you don't have the goal option, um, it makes it more difficult uh, in, a, in a direct seeding application. Um, so uh, this is something I actually have a lot of experience with, but, but again, transplants and goals seem to be the key uh, to making this, this work. Okay, uh, next one. Uh -huh. So winter squash and pumpkins, there was a question on that. Uh, this is a little bit easier. I think we've got some pretty good materials registered for winter squash and pumpkins. Uh, but still, you, you've got to be careful about how all this works. Uh, there was a question about transplants before and then direct seeding, and that's an issue here that I'll talk about. So basically, um, we're talking about the same herbicides as you would use in conventional tillage systems, which are, are, our mainstays really involve strategy, which is a, a pre-pack of command and curbit. Some people choose to use those materials separate. Some people choose only to use the curbit part or only this, the uh, command part. But, but strategy is a very common material. I find that in some, in some other states, it's not used as much because growers consider it to be an expensive treatment. Um, but for us, uh, strategy and sandia are fairly common to use. Uh, Sandia has the potential to be used either pre-emergence pre or post-emergence. The problem is, is that uh, if lamb's quarters breaks through, common lamb's quarters, and that's a really tough weed to control, once it breaks through, even though Sandia might take out, for example, pigweed post-emergence or gallon soger or a number of other weeds post-emergence, it will not take out lamb's quarters post-emergence. So if you find that you don't get good lamb's quarters control with strategy alone, You've got to have the sandia with it pre-emergence. Otherwise, if you get the lamb's quarters up, you're in some serious trouble. Um, so, but between the row, there's a bunch of options. So, for example, if you were looking to um, um, uh, maybe use transplants and, and, and minimize what you put in the row, uh, and you wanted to come in and do something between the rows, and you didn't want to row to till, or you didn't want to cultivate um, uh, between those rows or run a harrow or something, depending on how far apart your pumpkin rows or your winter squash rows are, there are some herbicide options for between the crop rows only. Now, of course, sandia can be used either over the row or, or between the rows, but AIM, which is a burn-down material, Gramoxone, which is a burn-down material, uh, and any of the post-emergence grass materials can be used between the rows of pumpkins and winter squash. The label requires that either AIM or Gramoxone be, be uh, shielded, uh, but the post-emergence grass herbicides can be used with, without a shield. Um, okay, and I think we've got one more here. Um, and that's sweet corn, and I would say that perhaps the easiest crop to grow 
uh, from a weed control standpoint is sweet corn just because there's so many options available. You've got great pre-emergence options, uh, and you've got excellent post-emergence options. I mean, if you're growing any corn, I mean, if you're growing field corn, you've, you've certainly got Roundup Ready as an option to be able to come in with Roundup. But the thing is, for sweet corn, when we don't have that option, we still have a number of options available. A lot of people are coming in with, with bicep early uh, or bicep with some Callisto added to it uh, or um, just dual or lasso as a grass material along with Callisto and a low rate of atrazine. Uh, one of the things that Callisto has done for us is allow our atrazine rates to get pretty low, a uh, quarter of a pound in some cases. If you're going to use the Callisto as well and you don't have any really bad weed problems, uh, any of the grass materials like uh, dual or, or lasso. And then uh, post-emergence, just a number of options that you come in with now uh, that, that are in the New York and the Mid-Atlantic and the New England guides uh, for post-emergence options for weed control that will control a lot of broadleaf weeds. And, and now um, uh, some better grass activity with some of these post-emergence materials. Uh, so I, I think we've got a great job, uh, potential to do it with, without cultivation. I think with a lot of the other um, crops that cultivation uh, – you know, has its place because you may not get great weed control depending on what's there. But sweet corn, you should be able to do the best job. And as you move away from these crop groups here, you move away from the crucifers, you move away from the cucurbits, you move away from sweet corn, weed control becomes increasingly difficult just because you don't have good materials available. And then you really got to start thinking about cultivation. And, you know, if your objective is uh, breaking the soil pan and, and working on phytophthora, you know, maybe having that residue on the surface is not that important to you. And, and so cultivation becomes more of uh, something that, that's a practical uh, thing to do in addition to whatever herbicides that you might apply. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and I'll take any questions if there's time. Thanks, Rich. Why don't we just start with questions from your location first? And uh, if we could just do two from a site and then we'll rotate around to the various locations. Anybody have any weed control Questions for Rich? Um. Okay, so a question was tomatoes. Actually, tomatoes are not a bad crop to work with either because you've got Sencor uh, to use. It's a good broadleaf material. Uh, the weakness with uh, Sencor is going to be uh, um, uh, nightshade-type weeds. Uh, so within the row, that could be a problem. Uh, this was assuming... We're not growing on plastic now, so this would be bare ground. I think that if, you, if you're going to use plastic, and I haven't heard much being talked about this, but it seems like if you're going to use plastic, you're going to be subsoiling, and then you're just going to be working the entire soil surface because I don't see how uh, practical it is to lay plastic with a lot of cover there. Uh, so, um, but I think Sencor makes it a little more practical because you've got some good materials there. Anything else here? Okay, I don't... Um, okay, how about we go to Western New York? I have a question. Um, did, did I hear you correctly? You said AIM is uh, used for burn down for lambs quarters and pumpkins and squash? Only between the rows, though, and, and I'm looking at, um, um, if I grab the label, I believe it's winter squash and pumpkins for the AIM label. Uh, you may want to just verify that. Uh, but that is a between row only, and it has to be shielded. Okay. Um, you can't use it on summer squash then, correct? No. No. Okay. no. Any other questions from Western New York? There are quite a few herbicide options in beans. So that that's one that uh, can be handled pretty well. I agree. I agree with you. We didn't mention that, but there are a lot of options. Uh, you've actually got better options in New York than we have in New England because of Reflex Label. Uh, and, and I know Robin Belinda has done a lot of work with that, so I would agree that uh, snap beans and uh, some of the dry beans have some great options as well. Any other questions, folks? We control? Okay for New York. Okay, um, uh, Long Island? Yeah, we have a question. Uh, yes, I've, I've been experimenting with uh, zone till sweet corn for the last two years, and I haven't been able to maintain appropriate weed control. Um, we, we don't have the use of lasso or dual, 
And so I've been using primarily uh, atrazine and prowl and or Callisto. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, what you think the best materials or best program might be. Um, so uh, before it, you answer, Rich, um, could you guys turn the PowerPoint off at your location? Maybe I did. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, certainly, we have we have a similar problem on some of our soils, our Zone 2 soils, where uh, certain herbicides are not allowed to be used. Uh, prowl and you know, prowl is not a bad material combined with the broadleaf materials. It, it depends. Let I me mean, just if I ask you a question back. What's what's the worst problem you're having with those choices that you're, you've indicated in uh, terms of weed gen species? Generally, grasses. Okay, uh, so I, I guess one of the things I would question would be uh, the rate of the rate of prowl to make sure you're using the right rate uh, to get to get that control. Uh, the other thing is that. Um, um, so you can't use any of the, the incorporated materials. They're just not going to work well in this situation. Uh, and when you take the, the dual and the lasso out, so really prowl is, is your, your main option there. But make sure you're using the right rate to at least get the right residual control uh, to start off with. Also remember that uh, prowl is a type of material that is taken up by the roots of weeds. It has no effect sitting on the soil surface. It has no effect sitting close to the soil surface because there's no shoot uptake. The way prowl is going to kill these weeds is by uh, inhibiting cell division in the roots as the roots are coming out from below the weed seed. So incorporation is critical. The other thing uh, in sweet corn now is that we do have, um, uh, um, is it accent? Uh, that it's been registered recently, and that is a post-emergence grass herbicide that's actually got very good tolerance in a lot of varieties of sweet corn. So maybe something you want to think about. And uh, then uh, some of the Callisto-like products uh, that have been out there um, have also um, have some potential uh, for uh, post-emergence grass control. Uh, they're not as good as using the right rate of prowl at the beginning, uh, if that will work for you. They're not as good as um, uh, the accent that I just mentioned, uh, but they do have, uh, let me just real quick, I'll just give you a couple of names of those. Uh, How would you incorporate the prowl if you're not telling? Well, you, you don't have to, you have to irrigate it. A prowl's not like Trefland. It does have some water solubility associated with it. Uh, so you can't irrigate it. You can't irrigate it. And I believe on sweet corn, you do not. You're not allowed to incorporate it, even if you are in a bare ground situation. So it's, it's a it's a um, it, it's an application that's made uh, uh, by putting water in. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is something I haven't said a whole lot about, but soils are generally going to be colder in this whole environment. That it's a plus in the row middles because it delays the weeds coming up. Uh, but it also can be an issue right in the strip. So one of our concerns about prowl on sweet corn is unusually cold soils. And so I'm always nervous about the first couple of plantings of sweet corn in cold soils. Uh, we tend to not use prowl as much and to use it on warmer soils. So that's just a little issue with prowl that I'm not really sure how you get around. But some of these post-emergence materials that are Callisto-like include uh, loudest and impact. And both of them have some uh, post-emergence grass activity. Uh, the accent material, accent Q, is, is primarily a grass material. That also works well, but it only works on grasses. So I think from, if you're not getting good activity out of prow, you do at least have some additional post-emergence options in corn that don't require drop nozzles. And those are the ones that I just mentioned, Accent Q, uh, Impact, and also Laudis. Uh, Callisto probably has the, the worst grass activity of that group, but it's not bad on small crabgrass. Anything else? We had one more question. Um, with the use of strategy and sandia in the pumpkins, um, pre-emergent, and with a, a bunch of residue, I know on the labels it requires about a quarter of an inch or so of rain to get it into the soil. With a good amount of residue, do you suggest more, and how much if we had to irrigate? I, I agree that you need more. Um, how much more really is really going to depend on the residue, but you know, maybe half an inch is not impractical uh, to get it through. Uh, it should move pretty well through dead plant material, uh, so I don't think you need an inch. 
but the other thing I, I failed to mention when I was talking about pumpkins and winter squash is that those labels, you cannot use that stuff over the top of transplants when they're newly transplanted. And so sometimes uh, if you're in this situation, uh, maybe direct seeding is the, is the better option because your herbicide options are definitely better with direct seeding versus transplanting. Great. All right. How about um, questions from here, from Ithaca? Do we have any questions? Nope. All right. Um, uh, any final questions for Rich from any of the locations? Oh, Jeff, we didn't get to your site. No questions here. He did a great job. Thank you. I, I, know, I actually, I have a question. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. All right, and this has nothing to do with weed control, but I've been thinking about this in the back of the room, and, I, and if I don't ask it, I'm going to feel bad because I'm going to leave to go to another meeting. So soil again, soils, the pH is going to be best near the surface where you're working the soil. As you go deeper, uh, how does that pH change? And when you pop that, that uh, uh, coulter through the, the plow pan and you're thinking about roots going down, how well do those roots grow as they go deeper into the soil, and especially if they're growing below the plow pan, and you're into soils that I would imagine <coughs> are fairly low pHs down there. How does it all work, or is water uptake all you're really getting out of that? Are you not getting nutrients from that far down? Um, I'm just curious about the deeper soils and lower pHs as you go down. So, Maybe I should have paid attention when I was in college, but but uh, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just take a, a hit at it, and then I would open it up to anyone else that has some experience in thinking about this. But as we, when we have this out, we are getting better foraging of roots deeper in the soil for nutrients. Um, observed or read anything about issues around the change in pH with the depth of the soil profile because that the roots are filling up that whole volume of soil that's been disturbed. And so the, gen the improvement in the root growth and the improved vigor of the crop and its ability to forage has been the benefits of doing this zone tilt system. So I didn't know if there was any other comments or observations from other growers that have been doing this. A lot of right. Am I on? Anu? Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. We've had several cases where we have gone through the plow tanks and got down into some pH of 5.1 or something, and it is absolute death on corn. They may come up and grow to be six, eight inches tall. When the roots finally get down to that layer of acid soil, they're toast. And some other crops have done the same thing. So deep tilling is can be death for a crop if they get down into a pH that's not appropriate for the crop that is you want to grow. We had a tremendous example of this in Pennsylvania in New Hampshire this year, and basic agronomy 101, you can't grow it in pH 5.0. So, um, uh, Jim, can you speak to what happened at that point? Yeah, the corn died. Did that, no, no, I mean, no. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Did the grower quit using the system in those fields? No, he, he's, he, he still wants to use the system, but he's not going to deep till until he gets the pH changed in the whole so, soil profile. He's going to be putting his nitrogen shallow, and, you know, tillage will only be 10 inches deep or 12, you know, with a, a strip till, so he's not messing around down in that low pH stuff. Um, you got to be proactive with your liming so that you, you keep putting it on if you're going to need it because it takes longer to get down there. Right, because the pH, you know, you've got to use a Cornell pH kit to take a pinch of soil from two feet deep or 17 inches deep or whatever and see if it's, you know, appropriate for the crop. If it gets way low, then either, you know, till and grow shallow or grow something else. Grow something else. <laughs> we, we haven't talked about sampling soil deep for pH. It doesn't take long and it's cheap for a pH kit yeah. in your pocket. You know, in a soil probe, you can tell what it is at 2 inches, 10 inches, 20 inches. But we haven't talked about it. We've talked about with um, uh, no-till doing shallow, shallow pHs and regular pHs. And on the muck, because of uh, real low pH stuff, 
Mm -hmm. We're starting to do sampling um, below 12 inches. And some, buck, some bucks will have a pH of 7, too, they if they clear down the into the calcium way, yeah. can be the other layer way that would decay to 2. But it's something that we need to consider is, is um, deep pH testing if, if you suspect something, I guess. Right. Ask the plan. Anu, I have a question for you. Yep. When you took the soil samples from the field you guys trialed this past season, how deep did you go on that? Because that field has been heavily limed for years. Um, the only thing I did different was the last three years, it's been a super heavy cover crop on it that I've, I've trying to build the organic matter in that field. Is that what drove that pH down so low? Because that thing came back like 5.9 or something. I mean, it should, there's no way it should be reading even close to that. What's so Right. That, we're all Cornell tests. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I think that we sampled that soil fairly shallow for the soil health test. I don't think that we did a full 12 inch depth on that, but we can do that again this year. Would heavy cover crop over an extended period of time cause that to be that low on the surface? No, I wouldn't think so. This is Jude in, in Massachusetts. Yeah. I have a couple of a little bit of experience to share with you on this. Um, Generally, with, with reduced tillage, you want to pay strict attention to your, to your liming practices. You need to do it more frequently, um, regularly. Um, we had a grower that has been using zone till for a while, and he was trying to zone till one year and then leave his, um, he was preparing beds, and this was for bean production, preparing raised beds with them to try to combat some disease problems. Uh, and he was leaving these beds for three, four years. Uh, and over that time period, his pH would dive throughout the in entire field, um, even though he would, would topically apply lime uh, on, if not every year, every other year. Um, so what we had him do was come back in and rebuild those beds, rezone re till every single year to solve the problem. Um, and that seems to have turned his, turned his plantings around. Um, I think you can run into some problems with this. For instance, Gary Sweet out in Ohio, um, does uh, zone tilling in the same slots every single year. He, well, he zone tills first, and then he uses a, a, a multivator over the top. So he's just basically strip tilling over those same zones and replanting in those areas. And before he came to New England to talk, I asked him, I said, uh, are you having problems with, your, uh, with acidification going on in those slots? Because in New England, with our soils, if you did that and applied some nitrogen fertilizers in, in that slot year after year, your, your pH would really dive in, in just a short period of time. I don't know what happens with Ohio soils. Maybe they have to sulfur their soils instead of lime them. Um, so maybe he's getting away with it that way. He, said, he claims his crops improving every single year, but what I suggested that he do was go back into those slots and uh, run some soil pH tests both shallow and deeply. Uh, and also between the rows to see if he's having problems with uh, pH starting to, to dive in those uh, slots. So there are considerations that growers will have to think about when they get into this type of thing. I think with the, with the deep zone till as opposed to a no-till system, you do have the opportunity to move some lime deep in the soil. Obviously, it's not throughout the entire uh, soil profile in the field. It's only in the slots that you're disturbing on those particular years, which again reinforces the fact that you need to apply the lime regularly. Thank you, Jude. Um, do we have other comments on sort of liming strategies or what people have been doing in their zone tillage, in their yeah, deep zone yeah. tillage? George yes. or Lynn? Yeah. Yes, we're in. Okay, well, I, go ahead. I, with lime and reduced or no tillage, I think the use of the airway tillage tool, if you put spread lime on the surface and then airway it relatively aggressively, you know, that rainfall will move that lime into that top six inches of the soil fairly well if we want to avoid, um, you know, tillage and, you know, full tillage. And we've seen that be fairly effective. That particular field I knew that you guys tested, um, that's the field I dumped the lime in um, in the piles that we work out of. So that's always the first one to get done every year. That one's never been skipped. And that's just been broadcast treated with lime. But it, there's been years that was done like three years in a row um, with high kale lime. That's why 
when I got that soil test, and again, this cannot be right, you know, with all that lime that's been applied to that thing. But I don't know. I I just the only thing I'd done different was it was three years of continuous rye. Um, I was trying to just do a little testing and see if it would help my phytophthora problem if I planted nothing there but rye. Um, so the, some of the rye had never had the last couple of years. I hadn't even taken the rye off. I just dissed it down, let it reseed, so it came up really thick. Um, that stuff was such a heavy, heavy sod this year. I had to spray that with Roundup a long time because it was it was. You know, it's a lot thicker crop than you normally plant. It's way more than three bushel per acre of seed. So um, I didn't know if that would have caused it or not. But it was, I, it was really nice um, loamy soil when I worked it up this year. I mean, it, I think I, I don't know what I did as far as organic matter. I was kind of shocked that that didn't come up either with the amount of biomass I put down in it over a three-year period. I don't know. I'd make a comment about the lime uh, that Jude was talking about. One of the things that we learned way, or we were told way 15 years or so ago when I started, was to move the deep, the zone builder strips every year. In other words, the grain farmer grow, will grow a 30 inch row and then the second year you're still in the middle. And whether it's sweet corn or vegetables or what, move it over to the side because I've been spreading lime regularly, but every year I till a little different place. I never go in the same row. And so, and those colders on the back of that tiller are tilling three or four inches deep to make that mound. And so you're working six to eight inches of ground to work the lime in every time you do it. And so if you move every year and don't put your row in the same place over a three or four year period, you're going to end up tilling the whole field. And that's making, I'm not having a problem with pH. Even though I zone till, or I use zone tillage every year, I don't have a problem with it getting lower and lower pH because I could spread a ton of lime every, say, once every three years. And then over that period of time, I work the whole field once and it makes it, it keeps working it in the soil. So that's the secret, I think, is not to put your row on the same place every year. There's other reasons for, in terms of soil compaction and other reasons not to do it, but the liming is one of them. Anu, we have a question here on Long Island about the lime, if anybody might be able to address it. Okay. I have a question in regard to the effect that compost might have on the pH in the soil. I recently applied approximately 25 tons of compost that tested about 7.5 pH, and I'm not sure whether that would have any long-term or even short-term impact on the soil pH. I was wondering if anyone could, could address that. Oh, I've not done any compost. Um, how, uh, how many years have you been doing this in a row? Uh, two. Um, we, we have done some work where we, we haven't used that high of a rate, um, but in other work and other observations, the pH does tend to go up slightly over time with heavy rates of compost effort. Mm -hmm. We have observed that, but it depends on the amount and um, how concentrated it looks on the field. Uh, 25 yep. tons of a material that... Um, uh, it can, it, depending on what the source of the material was and what the source of the compost was, um, will have a different effect. What the food stock was. Uh, the the other thing, grass and brush. Okay. The other thing uh, that you want to consider with this is um, the uh, organic matter in in your uh, soil existing. As was mentioned earlier, there was a problem up in New Hampshire when they were deep applying the, the nitran uh, for sweet corn. Uh, and what we determined that problem to be was that the organic matter levels were extremely low in those soils. It was a, a sandy um, Merrimack soil. Um, and uh, basically, it didn't have the buffering capacity. So when the, when the um, uh, all the nitrogen was applied all at once, um, what was happening was the, the pH in that area was, was crashing um, over a point. It was dropping from 6.2 down to 4 .8, as low as 4.8. Um, oh. Other areas of the field didn't ah. have, have any problems. So, so, so the more you put that compost down, uh, the more you're going to have buffering capacity in your soil, and you shouldn't have problems with that type of a, a pH drop, a sudden pH drop. 
And basically, that's the recommendation we came up with for the grower in New Hampshire, was to start adding some organic matter to his soil so that he could try to uh, get back to that um, uh, deep, deeply applied uh, nitrogen. Just a comment on Jude. Um, I believe that farmer in New Hampshire, the pH down at 17 inches was 5.1 or so. Am I wrong? I didn't do the sampling myself, so I'm not sure exactly if he did any any uh, deep deep sampling, but. Um, even on the surface, uh, in, in uh, six-inch deep samples, uh, he had uh, low, low pHs. I believe that phone call came out of the blue at a meeting in Pennsylvania, and the, I thought from the conversation that the, the crop grew to be six, seven, eight inches tall, and then the roots got down into that nasty pH 5.0, and then that's when they headed south and died. Is this a temporary pH crash? Um, because the, the pumpkins I had planted on this field where this pH was so low were beautiful. I mean, it was just a mass of green. Everything was fine. Um, but I had uh, broadcast 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, with my herbicide. I don't know. Is that possible that's what caused that pH crash? Boy, I can't answer that question. I know uh, the pumpkins are a little more tolerant to a low pH situation than the sweet corn is going to be. That's one of the questions we asked, we answered for Keith uh, during the questioning period. But I can't tell you uh, exactly uh, what caused it. I believe that that sweet corn in New Hampshire, that the nitrogen was placed about seven inches deep from the soil surface. Sweet so that too. the sweet corn was you know, most generally there's a rule of eight. The, the, the nitrogen should be at least eight inches from the seed if it's going to be below it. And I think that that nitrogen was placed shallow with my conversation with the grower. And I wonder if that didn't have play into this whole mess. It's a possibility. I guess, I guess you have to answer, ask yourself how critical the, the, the last inch is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> into the section of our uh, video conference where we were talking about fertility and we've just moved into that quite naturally. Um, now, one thing that we've started to allude to is the use of deep place nitrogen um, in the slot. And um, I didn't know if there were some growers online here that have been trying this and would like to share some of their experiences and what crop they've been doing this with. Uh, we'll start in Western New York and I'm not sure, uh, Ben or George, if you've been using deep place then or not. No, I haven't done any deep placement because I'm growing all my sweet corn and pumpkins now following killed alfalfa, so I don't need the nitrogen. So uh, Don Branton is the only one that I've had any experience with, and I'd be doing what he does if I needed the nitrogen, but I haven't needed any. So at this point, I haven't done anything except put the nitrogen on with the planter. And, uh, I haven't either. Okay. I haven't tried it yet either. It's something uh, I want to experiment with in the tomatoes and things like that, but um, I'm just not set up to do it and haven't taken the time to build anything to, to try to place it down there. Mm -hmm. How about uh, anybody else? I believe um, uh, Joe Brightly and Casey Kuhns did use some deep end with uh, squash and cabbage this past year. And they saw really uh, pretty good results with both of those, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In in our own work, we've been using, we've been looking and comparing the uh, basically a deep placed end with all of the nitrogen applied at the beginning of the season, and comparing that to a sort of more conventional program with side dressing, and we've seen no difference in the performance. Just confirming the observations that Donnie has had, and other growers have had around the region in doing this sort of placement. Um, and this year we're probably going to look at more closely using it with uh, brassicas, with transplanted cabbage, um, and perhaps also with squash. I'm not sure if there's any growers in, West, in uh, Western Mass that are doing any work with the deep-placed end. Um, I don't think so. You guys are, are both using it, right? Yeah. Um, um, no deep-placed end here. Uh, can we ask uh, the growers there that are doing some zone till uh, what their crop is and what is their fertilizer program or how they're going about it? Yes, um, I'll hand you over to Alan Zakowski first. 
I used it on cucurbits and sweet corn and tobacco. And I apply banded fertilizer on the cucurbits and sweet corn at planting time. And then I top dress just before they run. So most of my fertilizer is, is close to the surface, slightly worked in. And I don't really see a problem with that. We get a few rains, the nitrogen leaches down uh, to where it needs to be. And I've had really good yields. I'll hand it over to Wally. We're basically doing exactly the same thing. We use liquid fertilizer, band it when we plant, then we side dress with a Lilliston cultivator, and it's been working fine. Um, and that was. I think, we, I think we have one one other grower. <coughs> okay. Sounds like the the same system all around. Uh, and that was all. Uh, you said pumpkins, uh, squash. Yes. And sweet corn. All right. Uh, how about on Long Island? I know we have some growers on Long Island that are um, doing some zone tillage. Would they care to share some of their fertilizer approaches? I'd, I'd like to reduce the, using the slow release fertilizer. We haven't tried the deep placement of the nitrogen, but um, for the last two years I've been using a 65% uh, ESN nitrogen that we've been pretty happy with. Oh, great. Put down at planting? Uh, yeah. So that's applied at planting, and what's the crop? Uh, I've been using it on our sweet corn and pumpkins. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear the rate. Uh, been following the recommends for the r respective crops. Okay. All right. Um, any other um, uh, growers there that are doing some zone till that would like to share what their approach has been with a particular crop? Uh, Anu, um, we've always done, we've put down about, um, I think it's about 60%, 10-10-10 in the soil next to the plant. And then I follow up later on in the season with um, liquid nitrogen through the drip irrigation system. Um, we have worked with some um, slow-release fertilizers, but we found that our soils are cold, so they don't release quick enough, so we need to change that so that there's more available uh, in the beginning of the season because they get a slower start. Okay. Uh, anyone else from Long Island? I guess that's it. Okay. Um, how about Jeff? I didn't know if any of your growers are doing zone till in your area that would want to share some of their approaches. Uh, the people that have done zone till are not here at the meeting today, so we don't really have anything to add related to that. I did have a question for you, Anu. Um, first, what do you call, what do you consider deep placement? How many inches down? And then are you using any kind of nitrogen stabilizer? Uh, I can just speak to what we've been doing in our trials, and then we can ask. Um, I think that Jim Caprin in Western New York. Well, why don't we start with you, Jim? Because I know that you've worked with several growers doing different configurations. So why don't you start? I can't. Back of the room talking about things. I was just in the back of the room talking about stabilizers, and you know my theory on nitrogen uh, is that uh, we really. Sh where we're going to be putting it all on, you know, at or before planting with the ripper or the stripper or the planter, you know, ammonium thiosulfate liquid, nit with, you know, liquid nitrogen with ammonium thiosulfate is a very good way to go. Or, you know, Guardian or there's, you know, Agritain and some other, you know, inhibitors and so forth. And I think it, you know, is very, very important that we have it because the nitrogen is out there hanging around for a long time. If we can make it so it doesn't denitrify you know, in a soggy soil situations or leach in the lighter, gravelly, sandy soil situations. I think that's very important to keep our nitrogen where we want it. When we use that, you know, I call them happy plants. The corn comes up green, stays green, and never turns anything but dark green, you know, for the whole growing season, including, you know, sweet corn like we had down in Freeville and so forth. Um, I think it's real important for this nitrogen management scenario to have some an inhibitor uh, with it. And that works about six weeks, four weeks, two weeks? I don't know. 
30 days or so. Short, relatively short. <laughs> it's relatively yeah. short, but, you know, in a month's time or six weeks' time, we've got the corn up to where it's going to begin to take up nitrogen at a faster rate so that anything that's leached a little ways, we can probably get at and, you know, bring it back up with the roots of the plants. But you need some banded fertilizer to get the plant through until it gets down to the beak right. and until that's converted. I think the old standard two by two fertilizer, there ought to be in, in a corn, you field corn type situation, and I don't think that sweet corn is much different, needs 30 to 40 pounds in the fertilizer band to get that corn to knee high without, you know, its roots are a far greater shape than at knee high in order to you know, get any of that deep place nitrogen or band, you know, to blend beside the zone till coulters. Your regardless of tillage method. Your regardless of tillage method. The fertility deal is the same with conventional or with zone till. The nitrogen's got to be in the soil where it ought to be positioned correctly, where it's not blended throughout the whole soil, soil profile evenly everywhere. And what about in furrow fertilizer? Don't go too much. You know, in furrow fertilization, you got to be really careful with 721.7 or. 9189 or something, you know, a couple gallons you can, I'll go along with, but 10 gallons I'm against because you're probably, you run the risk of a stand establishment problem with the seed and the tender little seedlings. But you can't get enough on like you would with a starter then. You right. can't get enough right. nitrogen. Right. You know, too much nitrogen plus potash is where we get into trouble, especially if we put fertilizer in the seed furrow. You know, under five gallons an acre is, you can twist my arm, but boy, any, anything over three, I'm, I'm nervous. So um, as far as when we've been using the deep placed in, uh, we've been going about eight inches below the seed. I don't know if any growers have gone any shallower when they're doing some transplants. I think John Altabelli was going six inches below when he was transplanting cap, uh, cauliflower as far as his mm -hmm. placement of, of nitrogen. That's in How the are his results? Uh, excellent. He had a really great crop. He was really impressed with the performance. So is it is it better to say stay at like six inches versus ten for most crops or? Well, I guess um, a six to eight. I think eight inches is a good one. It's a safe place to be. And again, that would depend on your soil type. I don't. Think ten inches always just. Seeing any deep place then in Long Island. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no. Long Island, if you said deep place nitrogen. Yep. As far as in Long Island, I don't believe there's anyone there that's been doing it. Um, uh, any trials because of their stands and other issues. Yeah, Long Island, 